I'm black, I'm gay, I'm from the hood. Need I say more? Actually, yes, I do need to say more. Because a lot of times we get stuck there. And for me, a rich, fulfilled life is about not assuming we know about others based on color or mannerisms or zip code. It's about understanding the individual and hearing their stories, having an interest in who they are and what makes them thrive. So while I may be black, gay, and from the hood, there's more to the story than just that. When I was a kid, I had two dreams. One was to be an actor, the other was to become a photographer. And both have come true for me, by the way. And I believe it's because of the seeds of humanity that I was exposed to from a very early age. I grew up on a quaint little street called Bliss. Bliss Street. Sounds lovely, right? Bliss Street. There was nothing close to Bliss on that street or any of the other streets in the neighborhood. Bliss was one block over from Piru Street. And Piru is the street that history says created the Bloods, or the Pyrus, what we called them back then. But I don't have to quote history because I lived it. I was the first boy of my generation born to my family on both sides, and the first grandchild on my mother's side. So I think that's what kept me safe, but it was an unspoken form of protection that I knew nothing about. So I spent most of my days terrified. From witnessing my first murder at the age of four on the street, to having the family threatened and having to hide out because they were testifying against the shooter. And then there were the all too frequent calls from the police telling us to stay in the house because someone hiding in the trees in your backyard. I'd lay in my bed, hearing the footsteps just outside my window, dreaming of a place where I didn't have to feel afraid. I guess we were considered middle class because we owned the house that we lived in and a couple other properties in the neighborhood. And my, being the heir to my grandparents' meager fortune and probably being the only, the first grandchild, I was used to getting everything I wanted. And then I'd take the things i get and give them away to my friends who had less than me. My mother was 15 when she had me. It was her first time having sex. My dad was her math tutor, and he was 17. And my maternal grandmother was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. So I grew up in the house with my maternal great-grandparents, my 15-year-old mother, and her five younger sisters. My mother, Audrey, was a very strong and stubborn woman. The story I'm told is my gr grandmother went crazy when my grandfather left her to raise six daughters on her own. She decided that God could do a better job. One day she slid all their fingers and told them that God was gonna take care of them. And she left and never came back home. My mother, being the eldest, would steal food and get her younger sisters dressed and send them to school. And then she'd go to school with the baby. And that's how they found out that they had been abandoned. So they went into the foster care system, two to a home. So they were separated, but still together. My mother sneaked a call to her grandmother from the foster home and her grandmother stepped in and took them all out of the thing and brought them home with her because she wanted them to be raised as sisters. My mother was determined to go to college, and she wasn't gonna let anything like a little teen pregnancy stop her. <laughs> she gave birth to me on Thursday. She was, got out of the hospital on Sunday, and she was back in school Monday morning. She was one of the first blacks to attend UC Irvine in the early 70s. So I spent my summers, thank you, I spent my summers weekends and holidays at the university. And I was exposed to so many different cultures and lifestyles that 
I still have really fond memories of these two white ladies who would come and pick me up so my mother could study. They'd take me out shopping or to museums or to parks. And there was the blind man, I don't remember his name, but he would, I'd sit, hang out in his dorm and we'd listen to Stevie Wonder. He taught me to play chess and make homemade popsicles with uh, little toothpicks in them. Or Maria Torres. She's a stay-at-home mother of my friend Carmen. And whenever I'd see her, she said, how much do you love me? And I'd open my arms real wide like this. And she would wrap my arm around her and hug me back. And that was our ritual for four years. The smell of Nestle Strawberry Quick will always remind me of that lady. Fast forward to like 20 years later, I'm bartending at the Cheesecake Factory in Beverly Hills pursuing acting, and she walks in the door. And we stop, locked eyes. She said, how much do you love me? <laughs> I opened my arms like this, and I held her for like a good three minutes. So I didn't have any type of conventional upbringing, but I think it's the backstory to who I am today. I was covered by loving people who showed me what it means to have humanity no matter what color I was. But on the flip side, I wonder if that kept me sheltered from the atrocities of racism. Because I'm black, I'm gay, I'm from the hood. I should have experienced it firsthand, right? Not so much. I have never been pro-black. I was always pro-everybody. I've been stopped by the police while driving drunk on more than one occasion. I'm not proud of that. <laughs> but I'm an actor, I've had excuses, I've gotten let go. I remember getting stopped for driving without registration. And I told the officer that my headshots were ready and my roommate, I didn't want to wait until my roommate came home and he let me go. I've never been arrested. So when I'd hear people like my mother and other people complain about racism, I tell them it's their fault for not learning to assimilate. Boy, was I living in my own reality. I now know that just because it didn't, I didn't experience it firsthand does not mean that it doesn't exist. And with the recent, uh, the, the onslaught of like cell phone videos, dash cam videos, seeing people treated unjustly, I feel compelled to do something. And it's, I feel like it needs to be more than just marching or protesting. It starts with us. Like, us looking out for one another as human beings, not waiting for legislation to happen. Ronald Reagan, speaking to the United Nations, and he says, I occasionally think how fast our differences would vanish if we were under a threat from an uh, alien or something like that out of, from outer space. I think about that often. Like, our humanity under siege by something from out of this world. We would come together then. You know what else I think of often? What if we were all blind? And we had to use, rely on other senses to navigate through our daily lives. In order to get to know one another, we'd have to speak. And once we spoke, we understand that we have more in common than we do different. I've always had this sense that I was, I knew more than other people. It wasn't, it's nothing that it was taught, it's just a knowing that this is a smoke screen. It keeps us separate. We are so much more than just our skin tone. I don't define myself by being black, gay, or from the hood. And imagine all the assumptions that would be made if I, if I only shared those three facts, or if you only heard those three facts and didn't take time to listen to my story. Well, we all have a story. And our stories make us who we are. They make us relatable to one another. They humanize us. And with so much ugliness being uncovered in our nation, 
It's about time we lead with humanity and start to cover one another. Thank you. <laughs>